Bible evidences, which is uh, sort of related to what we were talking about earlier with buy the truth and do not sell it, but it's really a different thing. And I wanted to go to this because I'm hearing a lot of talk about evidences lately, and I guess it bubbles up from time to time, and so it's worth talking about it. I do uh, want to start with the positive, though, and say uh, that the Bible does, in fact, provide, if you will, indications of God's existence, um, which we sometimes call evidence. Um, I will put it in quotes because I don't really like the idea of evidence. I don't think there is such a thing uh, for God. I think God is, and uh, we're the thing that needs to be proven. But um, I will say the Bible itself does offer for our consideration uh, what we would call evidence in nature. The Bible provides some natural occurrences as existence for God. They are the evidence that he is there. And we're going to look first at Psalm 19. Uh, provided here an outline format to aid in our understanding, but the point is that the evidence of God's existence is nature. The first one we're looking at is Psalm 19, in which we read about his handiwork, that is, things that God did by his hand. We read about speech and knowledge that are available. We read about voices and words. And there's also a mention that there's nothing hidden from its heat, which I will leave dangling there. We'll talk about it in just a minute. But Psalm 19 says in the first six verses, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. No, there is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. And yet their voice goes out through all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In them he set a, a tent for the sun, which comes out like a groom leaving the chamber, like a strong man running its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, its circuit to the end of them, of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. These are the first few verses of Psalm 19, and what he says about that again is that the heavens declare the glory of God the sky proclaims his handiwork so we have uh, the ability to know something about God's glory when we consider the glory of the skies and of the things that are in the skies day to day poor speech night to night reveals knowledge this is to say from day to day from night to night we're talking about cycles Cycles, seasons, repetition, these things all uh, have a direct bearing. If you're willing to hear it, there's something being said to you. There is knowledge you can gain by observing these patterns, these cycles. No, not with speech, not with words, not with a voice. That's not how nature works. And yet, if you will, the voice of nature goes through all the earth. Meaning the sky, everybody has the sky. Everybody has night and day. Everybody has seasons and cycles. This is available to everybody on earth. And then there's this talk about the sun, which is just an interesting thing, that it comes out in the morning, it goes overhead, of course, it ends at the other side of the uh, horizon, and there is nothing hidden from its heat which is meant to tell us that God sees everything. <laughs> He's, he goes everywhere, he sees everything. We'll come back to that. The second ver or, uh, uh, passage where the nature is used as evidence that God exists is Romans 1. And what we're saying is you can know that God exists. There are things you can know about God just from nature. That's what this is about. Even without a Bible, these are things that you can know about him. In Romans 1, it talks about eternal power and divine nature. That's an interesting thing that you should be able to figure that out. 
And the result of it is they're without excuse. Okay, well, if you look at the passage, Romans 1, 18 to 21 is the passage, and it says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in those things that were created. So they are without excuse. Though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Instead, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Well, this is just describing how we ended up where we were. But I will go back over this briefly with you to show again There is wrath for all, <clears throat> excuse me, for all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Because we, if we don't have the truth, if you will, if we don't know it, it's because we are suppressing it. It's being held back. It could be known, but it's being obscured, it's being held back by people. What can be known about him, he says, is plain. It has been shown to them. What do you mean? Specifically, his invisible attributes, that is to say, the characteristics of God that you cannot lay eyes on. They're not physical. His eternal power, his divine nature, are clearly perceived in the things that have been made. Okay, But his eternal power and divine nature, why eternal power? Well, this world had to have come into being by power, and since time is the fourth dimension, a physical dimension, a physical attribute of the universe, it is part of the universe. It's a created thing. The one who created it must be without time, eternal. And his nature can't be like our nature. It has to be different from ours, higher than ours. That's divine. This just makes sense. And that should be perceived in the things that have been made. Which uh, Psalm 19 helps us to think about. That, hey, there are orders. There, there, are, or there is order. There are cycles, patterns, things you can look at in just nature and the cycles of life that tell you there's order, there are patterns, there's a governing uh, principle here. And it says, that's why they're without excuse. You can know this. And the third passage that I wanted to look at was Acts 14, where the Bible points to the evidence of God's existence in nature. Uh, as Paul and Barnabas are at uh, Lycaonia, at a small island where they worship Zeus. Um but Paul and Barnabas came and started to preach the gospel to them. What he tells him in Acts 14 is that God didn't leave himself without witness. So again, nature is doing something useful. And then uh, the things that he talks about, where the psalm had talked about um, other things like cycles, this one says he gave you rains from heaven, he gave you fruitful seasons, which are very similar to cycles, aren't they? But it's Acts 14, 11 to 17. When the crowd saw Paul had done a miracle, they lifted up their voices, saying in their native tongue, like Aeonian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus. Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the city entrance, brought oxen and garlands to the gate and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. And this is a very traditional Roman way of doing things. The oxen and garlands, you still see those carved into the buildings, and you'll see them painted everywhere in the ancient Roman cities. That's how they worshipped. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments, rushed out into the crowd, saying, Men, why are you doing this? We also are men of like nature with you. 
And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And then he says, in past generations, God allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he didn't leave himself without witness. He did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So this also tells us what Psalm 19 had said. That there are not there are no words, there's no voice, and yet their testimony has gone throughout the world. That's nature. Well, here's the thing with these passages. They're all making the same argument. They're making the same points to show that God can be known through nature. And uh, so we should break them down. Every one of them is doing these three things. Three things. First of all, Evidences are available to everybody on earth, no matter where they live. Second of all, there's no words, there's no voice. You have to be willing to see it. You have to draw the conclusion from what you see, what you're presented with. And third, we are accountable for our actions, whether we accept that evidence or not. They're all three saying this. They're all three making these same points, which we will demonstrate. But this is the nature of the evidences that God points to. They exist. They are silent. And we are accountable. We are accountable is the biggest one. But first of all, they're available to everyone on earth. Right, Psalm 19 speaks in verse 1 of the heavens and the sky above. We, have, we all have sky and heavens. Fourth verse speaks of through all the earth to the end of the world in Psalm 19. This means there is not a person on earth who does not have access to this information. Everybody can see the heavens. Everybody can see the sky. It is true that sunsets are better in the desert southwest. <laughs> Pretty lame in Colorado, in my opinion, that the sun goes down behind the mountains where you can't see it. Sorry, no offense. That's lame to me. I like seeing it go down. Of course, um, in Costa Rica, they would say that ours are lame because they land, it goes down uh, on land, whereas uh, in, in the Costa Rica, it goes down over the ocean. So you get to see the very last waning moments, but whatever, they all, they're all heavens, they're all sky, they're all glorious in their own way. And they all point to the glory of God. In Romans 1, when we say this is available to everybody, he said in verse 20, that what can be known about God is clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been created. So from the time that this place was created until now, it has always been the case that you can look at the creation itself to perceive clearly that God must be divine, timeless. Right? These things have to be true about him. Whoever made this. That is also something that is available to everybody on earth. We are all created beings. We all came from one, you know, from one man, one woman. That is how it works. Acts 14, where uh, he speaks to the, the Lycaonians, he said to them in the 17th verse that God gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons. These are, he said, he did not leave himself without witness. Well, what's the witness? It's rains from heaven and fruitful seasons. Well, everybody has this too. Even if it might be short, say if you live near the Sahara, or it might be long, say you live in the, in the uh, great Northwest. <laughs> you see rains from heaven. You see fruitful seasons. Everybody on earth 
sees this, and they see it every year. That's how it works, and that's how it has always worked. Right? The philosophers staying up all night arguing about where the sun goes when suddenly it dawns upon them. <laughs> right? That's the joke. <laughs> Everybody can get that one. Oh, come on. <sighs> <laughs> the second thing that they all three say is that you have to be willing to see it. You have to be willing to see it. Right? Romans 19, or I'm sorry, in Psalm 19:3 it said, There is no speech, nor are there words, his voice is not heard. It's true. The heavens declare, but not with a voice. The song says, in reason's ear, they all sound forth or rejoice. I can't remember, whatever. In reason's ear, which is a fun way of saying it. But it's true. There is no speech. There are no words. You don't hear a voice. But you can tell. You can see. If you are willing to stop and think about it, you have to be willing to see it. But you can see. Yes, God is in that. Romans 1.19 said, what can be known about God is plain to them. I mean, it, it's there. However, in the 21st verse, although they did know God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So it's available, but we're just not availing ourselves of it. When we're not living the Christian life, we're living in a way, I mean, we know that there is a God, or at some point we knew there was God, and we come to this place where we don't honor him, we don't give thanks to him, we live like he doesn't exist or even say he doesn't exist. But that's not how it always was. We were able to come to an understanding that he was there and that he was eternal and powerful. We just didn't want to. And in the 14th chapter of Acts, the Lycaonians, again, you have to be willing to see it. This one, I think, gives us some good uh, details to help understand what the point Paul said in past generations he allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Which is to say, there may not have been a direct revelation available to them. They may not have understood or known any better or differently, and they may not have been able to. And, you know, basically all the different religions of the world, they're not from God, they're from man. In past generations, that, that's how it was, but that's not how it is any longer. Nonetheless, even, you know, I guess despite the quote-unquote silence in which he does not, um, uh, in which he, yeah, in which he does not address them directly about this, he nonetheless has a witness in that, verse 17, he did good, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. If you are willing to give thanks for your food, if you're willing to rejoice for the sustenance that God provides, then, then you are able to see that, yes, God is in it. But in that 15th verse, we move to being accountable. Men, why are you doing this? You should turn from these vain things to a living God. Why are you doing this? Introduces accountability. They said, look, God didn't leave himself without witness. He gave you these seasons. Why are you offering this worship right now? We came here to teach that you should turn from these living or from these vain things to the living God, the real God. And the 18th verse records they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. The people thought they were the God. And they had to tell them, no, we're not. The real God is in heaven. He cannot be seen. But this means they're accountable. They should be turning from those things. And in Romans 1, um, at verse 18, we highlight the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Meaning God is angry. Does he have a right to be angry? 
with a world that doesn't know him, that is ignorant? Well, he does. He's angry with all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. By their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. Meaning, if you don't know God, it's because you've chosen not to know God. You've ignored the evidence. 20th verse there, without excuse. Though they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him. There's no excuse for this. You should have known better. You could have known better. There's not an excuse for, for not knowing God. And though they did know him, they didn't honor him or give thanks to him. And it's recorded, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things, if you're into the Egyptian stuff. And this is why God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the created thing rather than the one who created it, who is blessed forever. Amen. This is why God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Okay, that's the meaning of it. And, 28th verse, since they didn't see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. This is telling you that the behaviors we see in the world that do not fit into the pattern of nature, and there's a lengthy list here at the end of Romans 1. It's not just um, the homosexual ideas that were called out for illustrative purposes, there's a whole list of things, including disobedience to parents, that is unnatural, not following the scheme of God, and something that a person does when they should have known better. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. It's telling us that these actions arise from a refusal to acknowledge God, a refusal to thank God, a refusal to seek God. That's where these kinds of actions come from. They are significant, and they do mean something rather precise. And finally, on accountability, we go back to Psalm 19, where we started. The sun's rising, verse 6, is from the end of the heavens, its circuit to the other end. There's nothing hidden from its heat. That's talking about scrutiny, God's Scrutiny. He scrutinizes everybody. That's what he's saying. The meaning of that is not so much, isn't the sun cool, you guys? Oh, yeah, I, let me get back to the point I was making. No. <laughs> he's saying, the heavens declare his glory. The sun cover. you know, the sun circuits around the earth and there's nothing hidden from its heat. I mean, heaven declares his glory, and that one really bright thing in the heaven there, in the sky, that thing, <clears throat> as you know, hurts. <laughs> you don't look directly at it. You don't stay in it for too long, children. You, uh, you have to be careful about that, because it will get you. Leave toys out in the yard, they get bleached. They lose their color. The plastic breaks up, right? All these things happen because of the sun. It's very powerful. But the meaning of this is accountability, the scrutiny of God. He sees everything. He tests everything. And in the 11th verse of that psalm, as he continues the thought, he says, By the law and the precepts is your servant warned, in keeping them is great reward. This is accountability. So whether you accept you know, the evidence for God or not, you're accountable. 
because you should have accepted it. And whether you, you knew better or not, you're accountable because you should have known better. You could have known there was a God and you could have sought him. And if you seek, you shall find. Remember what Jesus said? Knock and the door will be opened. Seek and you will find. Ask, it will be given to you. He's talking about the truth. Psalm 19 is not talking about nature as much as it is about the fact that you can know there is a God and you're accountable for doing so. And he goes immediately in the rest of that psalm after verse 6 into the law, the precepts, the commandments, the word of God. That's what the Psalm 19 is most, I think, most famous for, actually. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, etc., But he said, by this law and precept, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So it's true uh, when you don't know God, when you are without God in the world, when you you are not a, a Christian, have not become a child of God, it may be the case that that's because you simply have not known what he teaches. You have not been exposed to the Bible or taking the time to read it for yourself, that is a possibility, and so you ought to do so. And no, we can't expect that if you don't know God and if you've never read a Bible, that uh, you know anything about the church in particular or about what it is to be his, his child. That can't be expected. You come to know all of those things through his word, and you come to know his word through seeking him. And you come to seek him through accepting the evidences that he is there and he is orderly and he is powerful and he is eternal. If you accept those things and you look for him, well, then he will be found. And then you will come into contact with his word. Then you can learn what you need to do to please him. What does he want? How do we serve him acceptably? But not until then. Still, the ignorance is guilt because you could have known better. You could have done something different. You you, you didn't have to reject the evidence that God exists, uh, refuse to come to know him, refuse to obey him. You didn't have to do that. And for that reason, we're accountable. We're all accountable for the things that we have done in the body, whether it's good or whether it's evil. So yes, there are, uh, in the Bible, there are evidences, but these are the kinds of things that the Bible calls evidence. Right? Nature is evidence of God. So there is much reward in keeping the statutes, the teaching of God, and today we speak about what it takes to be a Christian, to repent of your sins, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's resurrected, you can be buried together with him in baptism for forgiveness of sins, which comes through the washing of his blood, the blood that was shed to ratify your covenant with God, that you're going to serve him faithfully from here on. We'll help you to be baptized in his name, if that is your need today. If as a Christian you have not lived right, we will pray with you that you might be restored to him. You perhaps are familiar with other things that get called evidences, where people bring forth science and a whole lot of charts and history and things. We will also be talking about that. But your homework assignment between now and then is to find those in the Bible. That will tell you how this lesson is going to go. Today, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a child of God, you need to obey the gospel. If today is a Christian, you need our prayers. You need to let that be known now while we sing the song selected. <laughs>